after you've got most of the grease cleaned up off the lathe, I know you'll be anxious to turn it on and uh, see if it actually works. But there's a couple of things you should check before you do that. One is make sure that the uh, chuck is securely mounted. There should be three nuts uh, here corresponding to these three bolts. Check them and make sure they're tight. And if not, uh, tighten them up because you want to make sure that's all, uh, all the nuts are there and they're all tight before you spin it up. And just uh, close this. Give the chuck a spin by hand and make sure there's nothing unexpected there that's going to snag or catch on this uh, safety cover. Okay, so now having uh, made sure of those things, we're ready to turn on the power and start it up. So first turn your speed control all the way to counterclockwise to the zero setting. And that will ensure that the uh, chuck doesn't start up unexpectedly when you turn the power on. Make sure this forward reverse switch is in the forward position, uh, which is towards you. And then go ahead and press the green uh, power on button. And it shouldn't do anything at first. The power uh, pilot light should come on. You should see a dim green glow down in there. It's hard to see with this lighting. And now that we've done that, I can just slowly advance the speed control knob and the uh, chuck should start to turn slowly. And then as you advance the speed control knob, it'll gain speed. Now in some of the manuals, and I haven't looked at this one, uh, they recommend that you run the motor uh, sort of a break-in exercise by running it at certain speeds for periods of time to uh, give the bearings and other par moving parts a chance to break in before you start using the lathe for actual cutting operations. So take a look at the manual and see what it says about that and I'll do that if I remember. Uh, but anyway, you don't want to jump right in and start doing heavy cuts until you've uh, let it wear in just a little bit. Now I previously cleaned the oil off of this chuck, uh, depend I did part of these videos a little bit out of sequence here, uh, but I didn't mention that. But if you uh, are getting ready to start the chuck, you want to make sure you have something in place to catch the oil, because oil will spray out of here when it's brand new, and it will tend to get all over. You can probably see it's gotten back here on this uh, backdrop that I use for making my videos, because I didn't have it all cleaned off of there at the beginning. So make sure you uh, go through that process and get all the oil off of the chuck. And even so, as you spin it up to higher speeds, you can expect some oil to spray out from it. So if you're wearing a good dress shirt, you might want to think about changing that. Um, but, you know, that's something you'll have to deal with. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the exercise for getting the motor started. And we'll also put it into the reverse position here. Try it in reverse. Got the power on again. Okay, now in reverse, it spins clockwise as looking from the end, and when it's in forward, it spins counterclockwise uh, looking from the tailstock end. So normally the, the work is going to be turning towards you like this, and in the reverse direction will be moving away from you, so to speak. Uh, one interesting feature of this slave, because of its intelligent speed controller, you can actually switch between forward and reverse without stopping it in between, and it uh, is capable of handling that, even at pretty high speeds. Now about the only uh, occasion I've had to use that where it really helps is during tapping operations where you uh, move the tap in very slowly at the slowest speed you can typically uh, in the forward direction and then reverse the uh, chuck to back the tap out to clear the chips go back in the forward operation to draw it back in and repeat a few times as necessary depending on how deep and how big the hole is you're tapping but that's a great uh, convenience feature when doing a tapping operation the chuck has oil in it as it's shipped from the factory and uh, that oil tends to spray out when you first start using the lathe so I've set up a couple of shields here 
Now I can run that uh, chuck up to speed. And you probably can see here that the oil is uh, flinging off from the centrifugal force. So I'm just going to let that I'm going to let that run for a little while at high speed and get all that oil sprayed out of there while I've got these shields in place. Then when I get ready to work, I don't have to worry about that. Let's take a look now at the chuck and the spindle. And uh, just above the chuck here, we have the safety shield, which uh, can be raised and lowered. It's on this hinge back here, and the hinge is coupled to a switch. The purpose of this is to make sure that the chuck cannot start spinning, or the spindle can't start spinning while you're uh, working on it. For example, if you're putting a piece, a work piece in the chuck, or just adjusting the chuck, or getting ready to, to put it on or take it off, with this safety shield in the raised position, power to the motor is cut off so that the lathe can't start up. The other uh, major reason for this is that traditionally there's always been a danger of uh, inadvertently or accidentally leaving a chuck key in the chuck and starting up the lathe. And obviously, uh, if and when that were to happen, the chuck key can be launched anywhere into the shop and uh, be a very dangerous projectile. So this safety shield prevents that uh, from occurring since you can't get the chuck key, uh, you can't start the machine while the chuck key is still engaged. So it's a great safety feature and uh, I recommend that you always keep that in place. Okay, now I've got it cleaned up and uh, don't have to worry so much about the oil. But I did want to comment, this particular lathe, and uh, maybe true of all of them of this type, it's actually a little noisier, or significantly noisier than I expected. My experience with the brushless uh, machines has generally been that they're pretty quiet. Now sometimes when they're brand new, it takes a little while for things to wear in. The bearings wear in, the belt wears in, and uh, as that occurs, the uh, operating sounds get a little quieter over time. Sometimes adjusting the... Uh, the gears that engage the lead screw can have an effect as well. But one thing I have noticed over the years is that this uh, chip guard along the back here actually acts like a sounding board and it can contribute quite a lot to the overall noise level that you hear when you're operating the lathe. And you can mitigate that to some extent if you glue some uh, thick rubber foam, something like a mouse pad, you know, where you got a, like a quarter inch thick rubber foam pad you glue some pieces of that to the back or some other type of sound absorbing material uh, such as the stuff they sell for car speaker systems that will help reduce the sound. This bottom plate also acts like a bit of a sounding board and it contributes to the overall noise. Now let's take a look at over on the other side. But let me first run this one more time so you can listen to it for comparison. Let's listen to this lathe by comparison. Well, this is the uh, Microlux 7x16. It's sold by Micromark. But it's essentially the same lathe as the other one. It's uh, made in the same factory in China by Sieg, and it has the brushless DC motor, the same drivetrain. I do have a, a larger 5-inch chuck mounted on the spindle, but I don't think that's uh, making any difference in terms of the noise we hear. I think the, uh, the main difference for the lower noise level on this one is, number one, this machine's about 5 years old, so it's got uh, had plenty of time to wear in. The bearings are... Uh, broken in, and I think that reduces the sound level somewhat. But perhaps more importantly, as I've reconfigured this lathe in terms of the uh, the uh, chip guard that's in the back here and the pan that's normally underneath, I've removed. So underneath here, I have a piece of uh, laminated shelving material. It has a uh, sort of a plastic laminated surface on the top, and uh, you can buy this at Lowe's or Home Depot. Then I have another panel of that same material here in the back 
replacing the uh, splash guard that's back there. But that removes those two uh, metal surfaces, which as I mentioned, tend to act like sounding boards. And with these solid surfaces, it uh, reduces the sound by quite a lot. But I did want to mention the, some of the other benefits that I like about this. One is that uh, because I have this solid surface here, parts, uh, drill bits, tools, whatever, can't roll underneath the lathe as they often do with the stock pan configuration up on the rubber feet. And uh, I like this higher backboard because it helps to prevent uh, cutting fluid or oil or whatever from the chuck from spraying back onto the wall behind the lathe. And I've also made a little uh, addition here. I've got a little chart holder and I keep all my uh, reference tables for drill bit sizes and tapping and tapping and drilling uh, configuration information up here where it's uh, right where I need it when I need to do a uh, tapping or drilling job. So I wanted to show you that that will give you might give you some ideas for how you can uh, configure the lathe in your own shop and one other feature here is I have this uh, removable chip pan which is really just a cookie sheet from Walmart but that makes uh, cleanup real easy and you can wipe down these uh, white surfaces pretty well with a shop rag. So that uh, if you uh, have the room and the type of setup where you can do something like this, it's uh, a good way to go. But it's not good, of course, if you need to move the lathe around frequently. It does limit your mobility somewhat. So you can still move it. This is not uh, bolted down to the bench in any way. So if I need to move the lathe for some reason, I can slide it off of here onto the hydraulic table and roll it out of the way. Well, as we get ready to actually use the lathe for the first time, there's a couple of accessories that we need. And uh, along with this lathe, uh, LMS sent me some accessories that are commonly needed uh, when you get your lathe. But uh, the drill chuck, of course, mounts back here on the tailstock, and it's very frequently used. I mean, if you, if you use the lathe at all, any day that you use the lathe, you're probably going to use the drill chuck. So it's uh, essentially an, it's a necessity, and something you want to get at the same time you get your lathe so you'll have it there ready to use. And of course it comes uh, with a standard chuck key, but something uh, that may not be familiar to you if you haven't used a lathe before is that uh, a lot of lathe tooling, such as this chuck, uses what's called an arbor, and a tapered arbor, and they're very common on machine tools. And uh, they, there are various standard tapers. This particular type is called a Morse taper, M-O-R-S-E, after the Morse Tooling Corporation that uh, uh, formed that standard many years ago. And on the other end is a different taper called a Jacobs taper, which was, uh, I think, initiated by the Jacobs Chuck Company, which makes the uh, famous brand name Jacobs Chucks. And uh, it's quite typical in a situation like this, so you'll have two different tapers, one that matches the chuck, and one that matches the taper and the tailstock. So the tailstock has a number two Morse taper, and the chuck itself has, I think, what's called a JT33. Yeah, it's a JT33, so, which stands for Jacob Taper number 33. But there are other uh, numeric J Jacob tapers, such as 28, and I'm not sure what the numbers are. But in any case, you've got to make sure if you just go out and buy a chuck that you get an arbor that has the correct tapers on both ends. So the easy way to do that is just buy this kit from LMS and they'll take care of all those details for you. Now one other comment is that a standard Jacobs taper shank typically is longer than this, maybe an inch longer, and it's actually too long to fit conveniently in the tailstock uh, ram. And, uh, and the problem with it is it sticks out about an inch longer than you would like. And uh, so that's another good reason to go ahead and get this kit because it has a special short shank uh, arbor that's just right for this little lathe. You don't have to worry about it. On my early lathes I actually got a longer shank and I had to saw it off with a cutoff saw and then file it down or grind it down to smooth it out. So sort of a pain in the neck to have to do that. Now the other thing that you'll need of course is some sort of cutting tools and there uh, are several varieties you can choose from. Uh, let's see, I don't have them in here, but these are uh, one other thing. Let me, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. 
But uh, also included in this kit is a set of center drills. These are called either center drills or sometimes combination center drill and countersink. But what they are are short, uh, stiff, stubby drills with two ends on them. Let me see if I can zoom in and uh, get a better look at that. And uh, they are used typically anytime you're going to drill a hole in the end of a workpiece, you want to start it with one of these center drills, uh, which guarantees or helps to ensure that the uh, twist drill that you use doesn't wander off of its intended center point. So these little drills are very stiff and don't flex very much, if at all. Uh, and so they start your hole true in the point that you want it. And then your longer drill that has some flex to it will follow that pilot hole. All right, I've got the accessory kit laid out here on the workbench. And there are four different size center drills. And these are used uh, for different size holes, obviously, as uh, the bigger the hole that you're going to drill, the bigger the center drill that you want to use. But be careful when you're uh, removing these from the packaging. I actually threw out this little one here, this number one center drill. Uh, I threw out in the trash before I realized it was missing and I had to go retrieve it. So just uh, check carefully in the packaging uh, before you throw things away. Make sure you've got all the things that are listed on the uh, contents. Now the next thing we need to do is to mount the chuck uh, on this arbor. And before I do that, what I want to do is take a rag and make sure both of these surfaces are clean so that they'll mate uh, tightly. Now when you're mating tapers like this, you want to make sure that no foreign matter, and that is to say oil or grease, or even fingerprints if your hands are oily or greasy, uh, can affect the uh, bond between the two tapers. So you want to take a clean rag, not one that has a lot of grease and oil on it or chips, but make sure it's a fairly new and clean shop rag or maybe a, a fresh paper towel. If you like to use paper towels, that should work too. Although I think for this purpose, a, a rag probably works a little better. But anyway, just make sure you get any oil or grease or any kind of foreign matter that might be down inside of this taper here or on the outer surface of this taper because anything that's on there will uh, inhibit these two tapers from locking together properly. So once you get them like that, the way I like to do it is just take the two and position them with my fingers out of the way and kind of bang it down on a firm surface. And just that force is enough to lock up these two tapers very tightly. And if I did it right, uh, that should be enough to keep the two firmly mated for a long, long time. 